Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Mellon Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our event, Civic Engagement and the Determined Hope of the Humanities. I'd like to begin by inviting all of you to say hello and who you are in the chat, which is already happening, and it's great to see the scroll zooming along. We'd like to know where you're watching from and if you have any questions for our speakers this afternoon. As always, we love to see lots of audience engagement in the chat throughout the program and the greater exchange and conversation that the chat supports. Today, I'm so pleased to be convening a discussion on the power of the humanities, the skills, insights, and rigorous inquiry these vital disciplines provide. We believe that the humanities, and by that we mean the study of what it is to be human, right? So language, culture, history, philosophy, arts, and the critical thinking and understanding that come from those disciplines and that help us understand what it is to be human. We believe that the humanities continue to fuel determination and hope across the country, driving civic engagement both locally and nationally. So we're thinking about the humanities as we might encounter them in a classroom or as we might encounter them in public or otherwise in community. We believe the humanities are making change not only in our neighborhoods, but in our broader multivocal society. As we hold this conversation just one year out from the 2024 presidential election and with so much that is fraught. What can the humanities teach us about civic engagement and the sometimes turbulent American and global political process? How can the humanities help us stay engaged with each other and stay connected to the values of American democracy? Joining us today for a discussion, uh, our discussion uh, on, sorry, um, civic engagement and the determined hope of the humanities are our two guest speakers. Carol Anderson and Juan Felipe Herrera. Carol Anderson is, hello friends, it's so good to see you. Carol Anderson Hi. is a nationally recognized historian, thought leader, and professor of African American studies at Emory University, whose work explores the intersection of race and public policy in the United States, and so much more. Among her many celebrated and award-winning books, she is the author of one Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. She is a contributor to the op-ed pages of publications, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, and is a regularly featured voice in documentaries and talk shows, and is a member of the Society of American Historians, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Professor Carol Anderson. Thank Juan you. Felipe Herrera is a visionary poet, performer, professor, visual artist, and community builder. He is currently writing a poetry collection on the war in Ukraine entitled Handful of Gravel and is the author of more than 30 books of prose, poetry, and children's literature. In 2021, his poem Sunriders took actual flight from planet Earth in the interplanetary spacecraft, NASA Lucy. How cool is that? A recipient of the Frost Medal and a Guggenheim Fellowship, among many other honors, he is a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, a former poet laureate of the state of California, and the 21st poet laureate of the United States. Juan Felipe Herrera, it's so nice to see you. Great to see you, thank you. And so, Carol and Juan, we welcome you, and we thank you for for joining us. And let's uh, let's get to the conversation. Um, okay. First, a big broad, broad question. Big broad question. Uh, based on your own uh, work and experience as thinkers, scholars, creators, activists, uh, and people who have also um, devoted yourselves to making your work public, to offering your work uh, in, in a broad way. What do you believe the, the humanities can teach us about civic engagement? Why don't we start with Juan Felipe? Okay. Well, you know, uh, uh, historical consciousness 
is a is a very big thing and the most important uh, way to to see our realities, our social realities, without a sense of uh, our histories and the histories and the histories of our peoples, all peoples. Then it's going to be difficult to engage in, in society. It's going to be odd. We're not going to know what who we're really talking to or how we are related or what what the what the um, conflicts have been, the struggles, the survival. Uh, the journey uh, to the present uh, from our ancestors to the present. So historical consciousness consciousness is most key. And then there's also dialogue. If we do not dialogue with each other and we just stay separate as separate groups, as uh, we as we are presented most of the time, and uh, we find our way to each other, that's also very important. And giving uh, all the uh, falsities and uh, made up uh, mythologies, uh, what's taking place or what's important or what's real, uh, what we're talking about today is going to uh, kind of resolve that. Uh, we want to talk about what is real and what is our history and her history and how we relate to each other and how we can work together because uh, we're talking about engagement. Uh, and uh, so we have to battle or respond to uh, expressively in as many modes as possible to um, what is real, our realities, our social, cultural, historical uh, realities, our gender realities, uh, all those things uh, allow us to, all that knowledge, all that perception, all that consciousness allows us to uh, step into society and step into um, uh, being part of what's going on and bringing people in and bringing ourselves in all at the same time. So our poetry, our art, our voice, uh, our writing, uh, ourselves, uh, our families, the families of all beings uh, can blossom. And that's that's what it's all about. And why do you think, just to, to go further with that, why do you think um, the humanities in particular have those, mm -hmm. I'll call them superpowers? <laughs> yeah, those are good superpowers. Uh, you know, the yeah. humanities, anthropology, sociology, literature, uh, ethnic studies, uh, women's studies, gender studies, uh, on and on, uh, music and dance, all those beautiful things um, uh, allow us to express ourselves. You know, remember, with, without expressing ourselves, uh, we don't have a voice. And without knowing uh, who we are, and without discussing that, analyzing that, writing that, and uh, exchanging our thoughts and building our thinking and our knowledge about each other, about the world, uh, how on earth are we going to uh, change in, in a positive manner? If uh, we don't know about Martin Luther King, if we don't know about Dolores Huerta, if we don't know about the um, our ancestors here in the Americas, um, we're going to be lacking. And we're going to be partial. And we're going to be easily um, uh, taken by the kind of political hypnosis that takes place these days. Uh, but what mm. is right, what is true, which it isn't because it's fake. Mm. <laughs> we're having a hard time right now. And we're, we're yeah. being presented with a lot of fake mythologies of who we are. And that is not true. So the, the humanities then, we, we can grasp them. And of course, we're going to analyze them. And of course, we're going to discuss them. And we're going to critique them. And we're going to exchange, but most of all, we're going to have dialogue. That is so important. And thinking, mm -hmm. that is so important. And voicing and expressing and maybe writing poetry about it and painting a mural about it, putting it in the community, a beautiful mural in the community about the histories of all our peoples. How great is that? As opposed mm -hmm. to accepting a stale, hypnotic, uh, falsified uh, scenes of mm -hmm. who we are, which are not true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Carol, how would you answer that question? I would answer that in terms of what the humanities really do is they allow us to understand that in so many ways we've been here before and we have had mm -hmm. really strong, incredible, visionary folk who have figured out how to take on a Leviathan and really bring the humanity out in people. That is what is so mm. powerful about knowing what the humanities can do. So it is seeing the way music inspired folk 
It is seeing the way that art inspired people to build together, to think together, to dream together, to imagine together. It is seeing the way that political organizing has allowed folks to figure out where are the weaknesses in the Leviathan and where we as a people can amass our strength, our power to take on the thing that is oppressing us. And so that is what is the beauty of humanities. And it also allows us to see our joy, not just the suffering, but the joy, um, to see how people live into their humanity, even in the darkest of times, where they pull on from for their strength in order to get through, in order to not just survive, but to thrive. That is the power of the humanities. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that that you've you've turned us back to those examples. Um, and I was thinking about, I often think about Frederick Douglass and the power of the word and the power of the book, right? So as we know, with Frederick Douglass, he was remarkable orator and he used those humanities skills very well, but the people he was working with to try to end slavery said, Frederick, you can't be everywhere at once. Let's write it in a book. <laughs> and then we have um, a book, I mean, you know, s simplifying it, but it's an elegant story um, mm -hmm. that literally helped to end slavery. So what are some other examples of, you know, the way that that, that humanity's power has moved into civic space to make something happen. Well, you know, it's it's a uh, it's it's a uh, I don't know. It's it's a collection of so many voices. You know, so many uh, peoples, uh, like you said, Fred Frederick Douglass. So many peoples like him uh, that had to sacrifice quite a bit to just pick up that book and just and then open it up and then be inspired and then write, and then speak, and then stand up, and then face uh, the people, and face those that didn't want him to speak. So so the humanities comprise all those forces uh, by many peoples, and uh, the study of those materials, and uh, the, that dialogue I had mentioned earlier. So the humanities are a compression or an expansion uh, of many years and decades and more of those studies and those trials and uh, thoughts and questions. So it's 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 a beautiful ocean. It's a beautiful ocean of discovery, of sacrifice, of uh, thinking, of knowledge, of ancestral uh, wisdom, of uh, present uh, response to all that, and of uh, organization and uh, of organizing. And it just keeps on going. I mean, you can't stop a poem. You can't stop a mural. Uh, you can't stop a song. You can't stop a dance. Mm -hmm. So the humanities are like that, ever evolving, ever blossoming, ever sharing, and ever resp being responded to, and ever continuing. And it's like us. However, um, we are mortal, <laughs> and the humanities keep on rolling. So it's, it's, a, it's an incredible space of life a life that's flourishing, a life that is not buried, a life that's available, like a garden is available to each one of us. When you go to that garden, uh, each flower is a voice, uh, each uh, flower is a study, uh, um, an examination, uh, um, uh, knowledge, and it's freedom of thought also. There's too much going around at these, uh, in these days of uh, being banned, books being banned, voices being banned, authors being banned. And what we want, and through the humanities, in the humanities, as we add to the humanity, is freedom of thought. And it continues. We want to be free in all aspects, and the humanities provide that. If we uh, study them, and if we rethink them, and if we participate and have those dialogues, that writing, and uh, uh, that commitment, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I am I'm teaching the civil rights movement this semester is one of my classes and mm -hmm. my students are are working on research papers. Some of those papers are dealing with the power of music in mobilizing and organizing the, the movement freedom songs. Those freedom dreams yeah. coming through in the music where they take took those gospel songs, traditional gospel songs, and then added freedom lyrics to it. 
gonna no Jim Crow can't turn me around. Not gonna let Jim Crow turn me around. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and it's and some of my students are looking at the power of art and those visual images in building community in terms of tearing down those ethnic notions of who black people were and who the, who who society said black people were and they said no this is who we are and those power of those images in in the in the newspapers on in the murals on the sides of buildings um in the, in the flyers that were handed out in terms of building community in terms of raising a sense of consciousness about the community's own power the community Community's own image, the community's own identity. Um, mm -hmm. My students are just engaged with the power of art, the power of art, and the power, when you think about the power of poetry, I think about Langston Hughes's Let America Be America. That thing is powerful in terms of, of the image of what America says it is, but America has never been America to me. But then he keeps going on, he keeps going on, and he keeps talking about that that kind of multiracial, you know, everybody's feeling the brunt of this thing. But we can make America, America. So you think about what that kind of poetry meant at the time and what it can mean being read today. I mean, that is the power of the humanities. Mm -hmm. And you remember when that when that poem uh, moved into the explicitly uh, uh, electoral political realm when um, John Kerry uh, read from it let, and made it a refrain uh, in in a lot in when he was running for president. So it 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 mo can move in a lot of different ways. Um, and mm -hmm. so I would like to hear more because you say Juan Felipe and I agree with you that you can't stop a poem, but right <laughs> now. People are stopping poems, right? So, you know, as we know, um, books are being banned at uh, a, you know, ever increasing uh, and extraordinary rate. And what I think is very, very significant about the book banning is that it's happening at the same time that what I'll broadly call ethnic studies is uh, being criminalized in so many states uh, and cannot be taught. So these two things go together. And as we know, the experiences and bodies of knowledge that are the ones that are being banned are almost without exception, uh, people of color and uh, uh, LGBTQ people. So mm -hmm. it's not just some books, it's some lives. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of where we are right now. So I wanted to kind of bring that forward, but also to hear more from both of you um, about what you are finding on the road. Uh, you know, Carol, I'll call the road both your classroom, you know, in, in encounter. And also mm -hmm. because you you write for, for huge audiences, when you encounter um, those publics, when you're speaking, when you're reaching people through film. Um, what are you what are you hearing now? What are you finding out there on these questions that we're discussing? I find initially a sense of despair because it looks so bleak and so dark. But that's when I reach back and talk about how in the midst of the abyss, there are always folks who stand up and say, not on my watch. And it's knowing mm -hmm. that history, that there are those voices that then bring others around them. So I think about um, E.D. Morel in, 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 in Belgium, who noted that King Leopold was committing massive atrocities in the Congo. And so you have this shipping clerk who understands what is happening, that, that you have the king creating slavery in the Congo. And he's like, not on my watch. I cannot have this. And so he brings in other people. He goes to Britain and, and a movement begins to stop King Leopold from slaughtering the Congolese. That is the power of knowing this history. That is the power of knowing that having integrity, having a sense of vision, having a sense of morality, having a strong sense of right and wrong is absolutely essential and it's bedrock foundational for the humanities. What we understand in the humanities is we, we look into the abyss, but then we mm -hmm. see the incredible strength growing out of that darkness, growing out of that hellscape. And we see the people who envision what it could be 
and who are fighting for what it could be and how great it could be for everybody. And that is where that strength is. And so when I'm out there on the road in the classroom, um, at, 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 at a film premieres, at, at, at um, giving talks, what I hear and see is initially a sense of despair. And then as I start talking and start bringing out these histories, these incredible histories, people are like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. And so it's almost like church call and response, right? Um, and, and, yeah, and that, that incredible strength that comes from knowing that history, knowing that people have looked at 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 horrific atrocities, looked at 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 oppression that seemed unbreakable, looked at power that seemed unstinting, and they looked up and they said, "You don't know who I am. I am a mm-hmm. child of democracy. I am a child of freedom. We're not having this. Not on my watch." That strength is powerful. And and when you know that that power was there before and that power managed to get us to this point, it's that power that we draw upon, that power, that organizing, that sense of community, that sense of, of what the humanities, what art and music and literature and history and, and poetry can bring. That's the strength. That, that's what I hear on the road. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, Felipe, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What what, oh. what are you finding on the road? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's pretty much the same, you know. Uh all these readings and uh performance uh that I do and uh with uh with writers and with children and with uh, uh spoken word uh, poets and poets that uh they want to come come out of the woodwork and poets here in Fresno and throughout California and throughout the United States, uh, people people are excited. Uh, people are excited. Uh, they come in the hundreds. They line up all across the building. And I said, Juan Felipe, are you gonna are you gonna talk about climate change? Okay, because we came all the way from R- Racine and mm-hmm. and you know to Milwaukee. And uh, are you gonna do about climate change? Okay, tell you what, I'll, I'll write you a song right now. Right now, I want to write you a song, mm-hmm. and then we'll sing it. Okay, all right, let's do that. And then they come to the reading, and we do that little song. And but they're very, they're very um, there's hunger, right? There's hunger uh, and excitement, and uh, just ready to take off, just ready to take off. Mm-hmm. And we clap our hands, we do chants, and we sing out loud, and we read out loud, and we I read the poem, and we read it together, and it just it's just a lovely moment uh, of uh, finally expressing ourselves. Uh, uh, collectively, mm-hmm. unified, mm-hmm. in harmony, and the voice is extremely big and extremely brilliant, and that that's kind of a revelation of what we can do uh, with mm-hmm. our voices, with our experience, with our just what we have inside, not what we have outside, but what we have inside, mm-hmm. our inner self, who we really are, our voices that we've kind of had, you know, in 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 a little in a little bag somewhere. But all of a sudden, we tear it open, and we're here collectively in a studio space or at a university or on a kiosco like uh, we did recently a couple of days ago here at Arte Americas on Fresno. And if we, it's a little round, you know, that stage, round kiosco. And we got up there, and poets from Fresno got up there, and they were belting their poems out. I see a lot of um, uh, need and, and desire and excitement and and curiosity you know poetry you know what are they going to do poetry okay let's go let's go hear the poetry and then we boom it out and the poets boom it out and uh it's it's a beautiful uh deep uh very um um it's a collective self that appears we're no longer mm-hmm. invisible or we're no longer being invisibilized uh, we are expressing ourselves everyone's expressing themselves and they're writing pieces, and they're reading pieces by Neza Walcoyot, the Aztec uh, prince of the 1400s in uh, central Mexico. And they're reading poems uh, on and on, uh, whatever poems they want to read or that they write. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dolores Huerta appears, she's in the audience, and I said, come on up, come on up, Dolores. 
And uh, she says, well, I used to want to be a poet too, but I was told I couldn't write. Well, I, well, I said, Dolores, uh, as of right now, and then I'll, this is what I did in Bakersfield. I just remember it because she really wanted to be a poet in third grade. She really did. And she was feeling a bit um, sad when she was telling me that. And I said, well, I'm going to do something. We were in Bakersfield, and she was giving a scholarship, scholarships to youth, uh, Latino youth, a farm worker family youth, uh, so they could continue in the school, in school. And I said, I said, everybody, I said, people, I got, I got something to tell you. And they all, everybody opened their eyes. I said, well, I want to make an announcement. This is when I first was moving around as California poet laureate throughout the state. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, by the powers, by the powers vested in me as poet laureate of California, today I am, I am announcing that Dolores Huerta is the poet laureate of Kings County. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And and that's what happened. And she was so happy. But, you know, Beautiful. she continued. She continued and became a, an incredible community organizer and made a big impact worldwide. Mm -hmm. But it was so good what to I do love that. About that too, and with that moment of sort of of, of naming um, someone with um, with with certain gifts within a community and calling it poetry, you know, getting to the essence of what it means to be a committed truth teller helping a community move forward, uh, you know, in the way that she has for decades and decades and decades. Um, I wonder, um, Carol, if we could talk about the academic humanities and, you know, what we're seeing across the academy now uh, is, you know, I mean, again, you know, departments that, you know, all of the hyphenated studies uh, uh, becoming unteachable in many places by law. Um, it, places where, you know, languages and other things, humanities departments have been um, economically vulnerable for a very, very long time, for a very, very mm -hmm. long time, but increasing now, um, there's been a suspicion of the humanities uh, that is, you know, well, what, what, what job do you get with that? So therefore, mm -hmm. maybe that's not what young people or any people should be doing in school. Um, so where are we now um, with 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 um, higher education uh, and what's happening with the humanities? So I think what you're seeing is a is a really horrific convergence of two major strands, at least two major strands. One is the kind of vocational bent in education that you only go to school in order to get a job, a particular job. And so you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be in business. And so to think about the humanities, so it's like, well, what kind of job can you get with an English degree? And so you get that kind mm -hmm. of heavy vocational bent. The other bent, so there's three uh, three strands. The other bent, the other strand is the the hatred of education, the dis trying to dismantle public education by a massive defunding of public education. And so you see hundreds of millions of dollars pulled out of operating budgets from, from universities, state universities, by the state legislatures. Um, and so when you begin to defund the university and you're requiring the university to continue to operate at a certain level without the funding they need in order to to handle the number of students that are there in order to have the faculty that you need, in order to have the resources, like the books in the library, um, the databases in the library, which are all which all cost. When you're pulling that money away, then you're 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 forcing the university to make decisions about where are where's where are the big bucks? How do I keep this this enterprise afloat? And then I think that the third the third strand that is coming in there is 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 you know. Throughout this conversation, we have been talking about the power of humanities in, 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 in catalyzing people's imagination about what freedom could look like, about what democracy could look like, about what their full humanity could look like. And so when you have that kind of power that's in the humanities, where people can actually have freedom dreams and know it's okay to dream, 
And then you have the the kind of vocational sense that that you need to you, education is only for a job. And then you have the dis the disdain for public education, the disdain for higher education, coming in from 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 policymakers. Those three things, I believe, have combined to create this incredible crisis that we're in right now, where they feel very comfortable in in saying, oh. Who needs that ethnic study stuff? Oh, who needs that African-American study stuff? Who needs that Latino study stuff? Who needs that stuff? It's a way to make invisible the people. It is a way to, to just erase their very being. And because this is a nation that is really comfortable with talking about makers and takers. So who made this nation? Who is worthy of this nation? Who built this nation? If you erase that history, then you come up with a very flattened narrative that means that there are only certain people who are deserving, deserving of the Bill of Rights, deserving of the right to vote, deserving of good housing, deserving of access to quality health care, deserving of, of a quality education, quality K through 12. And so it limits who's deserving when you're able to make invisible the histories and the contributions of wide swaths of people. So that's what we're up against. But again, when people understand how 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 they're they're being um marginalized, how they're being mm -hmm. eviscerated, they fight back. So you're seeing mobilization happening where with these banned books. So you're seeing groups, students, students developing banned book clubs so that they could read the banned books because they know there's something in those books that I'm not supposed to read, but that <laughs> I'm supposed to read. And so I'm going to read what I'm going to read. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, and, and you saw parents, parents who weren't part of that vocal piece, who were shutting down books and shutting down curricula, who were like, wait a minute, my baby, my baby has a right to be able to learn. My baby needs to know about the incredible diversity of this nation, the incredible diversity of this world, needs to know who these folks are, needs to know how mm -hmm. to navigate in this space. And why are you sitting up here trying to deny my baby that ability to have the knowledge to be able to do that? And so mm -hmm. as in our histories, what we're seeing is people who are feeling the, the, the oppression, the evisceration, the need to make them invisible. They're fighting back. This is what led Carter G. Woodson to found African-American history, um, because he saw in the nadir when you're having the rise of Jim Crow and the massive lynching that is happening, this this kind of sense where, you know, the African descendant never brought anything to this nation. They never built anything. They never had a culture. They never did anything. They had to, you know, they needed the benevolent hand of slavery. And without the benevolent hand of slavery, they have gone wild. So that was the narrative that was being told. And Carter G. Woodson said, not today, Satan, not today. <laughs> and then just started doing that heavy, heavy lifting of African-American history, telling that tale with all of the power and all of the rigor that it deserved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. That's well said. Well, and what was and and what would let's talk about um you know in the where we encounter the humanities, uh, starting with you Juan Felipe. Well, what's a what's an example of um public humanities, humanities not in school, humanities, you know, out in public somewhere where that you think is being done very very richly, very powerfully, very effectively. That's a that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't I don't know if we call them humanities, but you're right. Uh, they are public humanities. I think it goes back, uh, as we were saying earlier, uh, to the poets, uh, to the dancers, uh, to the singers, to those organizing uh, their community, to the uh, danzantes, uh, Aztec danzantes, uh, that form a circle in their own community, like in Watsonville or San Diego or almost every city. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that happened, but it was it became a very beautiful national, uh, international movement with the Mexico and Latin America and uh, and um, new, the United States kind of began in 1973 uh, in San Francisco with uh, the visits of some of the uh, uh, dance leaders and that met up with uh, the, the poets in San Francisco, like Entozaki Shange and Alejandro Murgia, mm -hmm. Janice Murkitani, and another group. But mm -hmm. the teachings began, and then everyone was, well, let me try it, let's dance. 
when I learned those dance steps and what they mean and the drum and honoring the uh, the sun and the earth and uh, and on uh, the public humanities. Uh, once again, it's how we come out uh, uh, in the Chicano Park. Uh, the police uh, were, or the highway patrol was going to, and this is a Logan Heights barrio in San Diego, California. I went, I was in that barrio for, uh, I grew up in that barrio, Logan Heights. And uh, it was going to be a, a patrol station being built in the middle of the barrio. And uh, the some of the uh, youth uh, were walking by and uh, noticed the, the police or the, you know, the architects or whoever it was beginning to make a plan on that small plot of land. And uh, everybody got together and said, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, look at the pillars, because this was taking place underneath the uh, bridge that goes uh, across uh, San Diego to uh, Coronado um, and on. And we look at those pillars, those giant cement pillars. They're perfect for a mural. Perfect. And we can mm. paint and we can draw and we can present who we are. And that's what that's what, that's what took place. And, to, and now that whole place is a uh, kind of a historical site, but it took all these years. So so the public humanities kind of been generated as they would uh, by our, our own communities, whether it's dancing or um, painting or just getting up there and, and, and reading that poem that you have or tapping and reading at the same time. Um, I forgot uh, uh, Maurice Chestnut, tap dancer. I met him in uh, Newark, um, and he says, mm -hmm. well, right, "Yeah." I said, "What are you doing? Well, we're going to do this together." I said, "We are." Well, well, I'll be. Well, let's do it together. So, right, he did. It. He put down his little wooden block on the floor, and he started tap dancing. And I mm -hmm. was on the mic. He started engaging. So it's kind of uh, it's community born humanities. Uh, and it's humanity-born humanities. Uh, it doesn't necessarily come from a, a kind of traditional institution, but our own community institutions. Uh, there's a lot of centros culturales that kind of grew, grew during the uh, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And they have changed, of course, uh, but they uh, left a great legacy and uh, a lot of artists already starting up. And so it's, uh, and it's been very powerful throughout the Southwest. I don't know if it moved all the way east. Of course, the East Coast had um, Puerto Ricano and and the great poets of New York, uh, Latino poets like uh, Victor Hernandez Cruz and mm -hmm. uh, Africa, uh, Tato Laviera, Miguel Algarín, mm -hmm. who passed away, and uh, great writers. And they just came out. They just came on out. And they were influenced by various things, uh, the movement, uh, uh, politics, uh, the uh, removal of power, and we have to just carve that power back in. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, that's been my that's been most of my life, is working in communities mm -hmm. and schools, as you know, and and right there in Chicano Park. <laughs> I, I did so much in Chicano Park. I even portrayed the Easter Bunny one time, <laughs> as well as poetry. <laughs> and then the, remember the the theater movement. Remember the street theater movement. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, also, yeah. Right, that's that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful flower of community humanities, and, but it was hundreds mm -hmm. of theaters, hundreds of theaters, self-taught, self-made, and mm -hmm. all the issues that we were facing, right? All the issues that we were facing in the community: police brutality, uh, schooling, uh, affirmative action, non-affirmative action, anti-affirmative action, uh, Vietnam, and since since those years, since the mid '60s. To the present, those theaters, those street theaters, community theaters, have been in so much beautiful work as the spoken word artists and, and poetas and danzantes, and all that has been uh, incredibly influential. The danzantes uh, brought us um, uh, the the um, the values uh, of uh, of the danza and what the danza means, and its Aztec roots, all the way from Mexico mm -hmm. City. And other areas, of course, there's also the Mercado, uh, the Mercado Teatros, the, 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 the political theaters that came out of uh, incredible, large, giant mercados, marketplaces, and how they were being treated. The workers, how they were being treated. So they created a theater, Teatro Ambulante, um, the, I think the Puebla, 
and they were like the mm -hmm. moving theater, and they talked about their reality as uh, you know sellers of chile and corn and tortillas, but how the, mm -hmm. how life was in that in that sphere, and where where did we get that information? Where did we get those stories? So we were getting them from that particular theater, and of course it was mm -hmm. women's theater, and uh, women's collectives. And all the way to Seattle and beyond, the Spider Women's Theater, and Berkeley. So, so the so I kind of meandered and traveled in those theaters and in those spoken word uh, uh, boxes or crates. I even stood on crates in San Francisco. I said, "Everybody says you mm -hmm. can stand up on a crate and speak, so I think I'm going to stand up on a crate and do some poetry, say how it feels." So all that is available, was available, has been available. And and then the 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 weaving of all of us, not just brown and or black or Asian, but just keep on weaving, keep on weaving. And right now, it's I think it's at a beautiful um, cross section. Uh, but those are the key key groups let me, that. And let me pause us just for a minute because yeah. I want to um turn. We have so many questions from uh, the audience, okay. and so I want to mm -hmm. um to get us to a couple of those. Um, I'm going to put two together that are uh, in the same zone. Um, and this is from Michael Chambers at Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. The question is, given the current political climate and recent setbacks, Roe v. Wade, aff affirmative action, uh, so forth, how can the humanities drive our nation toward enlightenment and progress? And then I want to put that along with uh, Candace Lilliquist uh, from the National Education Association, who asks, how do we return to a shared agreement on facts? We can have different opinions, but if 408 people ran a race, there's no debate about the number of people who ran the race. <laughs> so, you know, really getting us, maybe Carol, you could dive in, uh, you know, to to the political climate now, the current divisions, and the role of, um, of facts. Okay. So shameless plug here. This is exactly what I tried to do with one person, no vote, was to, to, to because we have this narrative about um, massive rampant voter fraud and the need to protect our, our, our elections from all of these people in the city who are out here trying to steal honest, hardworking democracy from, you know, from good, honest, hardworking folk. And, and it was to break apart those, those, those narratives that were out there to see how they really function and to put the facts out there. So this is what voter ID really does. This is how it came to mm. be. This is what it looks like. This is how it operates. This is how gerrymandering really works. This is what it is designed to do. This is what they say it's doing. This is what it is designed to do. And so part of the, the power of the humanities is it gives you a history in order to understand what it is that you're looking at. And it gives you the critical thinking skills to be able to pull apart narratives to understand what is fiction and what is fact. And you keep mm -hmm. arguing on the facts, the facts, the facts. And, and, and there are some folks who are absolutely, let's be true, immune to fact. You can't mm -hmm. get to them. But there are so many other people who just want to know, how did we get here? What is this? And, and so how we, how we get out of this is we have to organize and we must vote. We must fight for this democracy. We must fight for this democracy that we have the vision of what it could be. So again, I go to lengths to use. America was never mm -hmm. America to me, but my God, one day it will be. Um, and and that's 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 how we we deal with the issues of 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 of, of fiction masquerading as fact, and how we deal with trying to deal with evidence. And we keep coming back to the evidence and we keep citing the evidence, making it really clear. We're not making this up. This is this, you know, feel like TLC. This is how it works. This is how it works. Um, so seeing how it works um, and in their own words and being really careful about the documentation of what they said, when they said it, how they said it, why they said it um, and what they were what it was designed to do. And so it is about making people believe that democracy is not worth it or that your vote is not worth it. 
how we how we're able to deal with issues of book bans is we need to have people in power who really believe in the power of the First Amendment, who really believe in the power of democracy. That's what we need to have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Here's a question from Michael Feldman. Okay. Oh, go ahead, please. No, no, go ahead. Well, we just gonna. <laughs> uh... You know, it made me, oh, this uh, question made me think of Mrs. Sampson, Mrs. Lelia Sampson. I always talk about her, my, my third grade teacher in Logan Heights and uh, Army Barracks, which were our classrooms. And uh, she played a lot of gospel with a giant phonographing class in third grade. I had never said anything in class. It was, you know, I was speaking Spanish most of the time and I got punished for that early on. So when I was in Miss Sampson's class, she goes, I want you to come up to the front. Well, that's the last thing I'm going to do. I said to myself, and I, I went up to the front. She goes, "Okay, can you turn around and look at look at the class?" I go, "Okay," but that's the last thing I'm going to do. But I did it. She goes, "I'm right next to you." All right, all right. Now, now sing a song. Oh my, you got to be kidding. Okay, <laughs> so I sang a song, the great song, the operatic song called Three Blind Mice." So, <laughs> so I sang that song. And she turned around to me and she said, you go. She said, Juan, you have a beautiful voice. And I had it, I I I wasn't I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what I didn't, I didn't want to accept it. I had never heard of that, never heard that phrase before, either the word voice or the word beautiful. <laughs> and she said it. And by the end of the year, she had me singing a solo to Swing Low, Sweet Chariot in front of the whole assembly, the whole school. <laughs> So, so I'm just saying that because what has to happen, one of the things that has to happen is to stand up. Is to stand up. Yes. Right? We've got to stand up and face the reality that is, a, there's, a, there's an issue with. Uh, there's a problem. There's a, a opposition. Uh, there's lies flying right through, through everything. And uh, falsities, all that is going on, and we're being pushed around by all that. We're being pressed against the wall. Our our, our freedom, our sense of freedom is being being eroded. Our values are being torn apart in some way. We don't want to do that, but it begins to happen. So we got to stand up, just like mm -hmm. in, just like Mrs. Sampson said. Can you please come up to the front? Okay. All right, mm -hmm. and stand up. Okay, mm -hmm. now, now present yourself. Mm -hmm. Present yourself. Yeah. Okay, and um, I think that's uh, that goes to it's part part of what uh, what Carol says. It's, it's connected to what Carol says. We got to stand up. We got to write that poem. Whatever you're feeling, whatever you believe in, whatever you really want to be said, whatever you think was wrong, what do you think was uh, put you put you down or uh, your peoples uh, got pushed aside or segregated once again or lied about. Well, it's time to write. It's time for you to speak up. Mm -hmm. Stand on that corner, whether it's by yourself or put a group together, get a string bass, some congas, and a, and a saxophone, and go big if you want to mm -hmm. go big. But you can just stand up and sing. Or just stand up and say it. Mm -hmm. Stand up and say it. Mm -hmm. and don't, don't wait till you organize a thousand people. You probably can't. But let's start. Stand, mm -hmm. up, stand up, and say it. So I think that it comes from you. It comes. It comes from us, from our deep down inner voice, which is our true voice. Let's get that true voice out. Let's be true persons. I went down to Mexico, uh, 1970. I wanted to connect with my ancestors. Everybody was talking about identity. I said, "Well, let's." I like talking about it, but we got to meet each other. You know, we got. We can't just talk about Aztecs and Mayas. Let's get on down. To the to to the earth and meet the peoples and sit down and share whatever we're going to share, and and um, uh, so so I got so excited about this story <laughs> that I'm losing my point of view here, uh, and and that was very very effective. That was, that that made a lot. That just put it together for me. Meeting the Lacandon Mayas and then sitting down in a in a hut uh, made up of course made by hand, and they said, oh, Juan, she, you know, I took a group of my friends at UCLA, and uh, we all went. And I said, and he said, Juan, um, you know, uh, uh, our forest is gone. 
has been chopped down by the lumber company. And, and our animals have been just taken, killed, and most, you know, we have maybe three left. And the women have been raped. And we just straight out, that's what, that's what one of the leaders of the of that particular village said. So when I went there, oh, okay, identity, what's my identity? I want to know, I want to meet my, my ancestors. Well, that's okay, that was good. But they wanted to talk about what had really happened and their, their uh, history. Mm -hmm. So then, like we came back, I came back, and I said, "I gotta, I gotta get get this together." And this is this stuff. Sometimes the things we don't we don't want to talk about things because they're painful, and and people have suffered. We have suffered. Our communities are suffering. So we just got to stand up and speak it, and write it. If you want to get into poetry, mighty fine. Stand up because you do have a beautiful voice. You really do. You don't think we do. So many years being told we shouldn't speak. So many years told we have accent. So many years we've been told not to speak in Spanish. And all of a sudden, we got to rip that away and stand up and speak and sing and write that poem and blow that poem and give it away to the people. And we'll make a connection and people are going to listen. And, and that's good. That's good right there. And that's a value you know, because you have to you have to value yourself. You have to value yeah. others to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, here's a question that takes uh, that into the very very brass tacks from Michael Feldman. How do we link humanities to specific, actionable, practical, and nonpartisan action steps for individuals and groups to take on sp critical issues for the U.S. and globally? So that's a, a a big question, but but Carol, can you drive a lane in that question? Yes. Yeah, so how do we take it on? Is we um, again? I go back to the history. Um, you understand the history of how we got here, because I mean, it it this didn't happen like Athena just popping right out of Zeus's head. <laughs> Humanities, right? Um, this happened because there were a series of decisions that were made and decisions not made by a series of folk understanding what those forces were, what was driving them, how did we get here? Knowing that history means that you, you don't get seduced by the false narratives. It means that it allows you to have a common shared understanding of the forces that put us in this place in the first place, which means that once you know how you got here, you got a much stronger sense of how you get out. And that's how we do this work, knowing this history. And there, there are some incredible histories that are that are being written or that have been written that are out there that help lay this thing out clearly and inaccessibly with strong scholarship, strong academic rigor. So you can follow the sources. You can find it for yourself, too. And so the historian, the historian in me is like it is through this kind of work. Um, of of understanding the understanding the forces that brought us to this point, so mm -hmm. we we can have this common shared history, this common shared language, this common shared knowledge base that gives us the ability to. So when knowledge becomes partisan, and that's where we are yeah. right now, knowledge has become partisan, and it's not. It it's not. Either he did it or he didn't do it. <laughs> Either he said it or he didn't say it. Either he meant it or he didn't mean it. <laughs> sometimes it's just that simple. So we have to understand mm -hmm. sometimes it really is just that simple. And so we have to look at those facts and then move our way through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, there's another um, another question for you, Carol, that um, that follows up with some of what you've been talking about from someone called Ross who says, how do you square the idea of the humanities as a uniter with your idea of the humanities as a weapon against oppression? Might there not be a role for the humanities to bridge the gap between the people and what you call the Leviathan? And that will require that the Leviathan... The, thank you, Ross. I wanted to bring the Leviathan back. So thank you, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would require that the Leviathan um, is able to really tap into its own humanity. 
and is able to see the other the other's humanity. So part of the way that oppression works is you strip the other of their hum hum humanity. You strip them of being human beings. You strip them of being people. You strip them of having culture. You strip them of having ideas of wants and of dreams. And you break them down in terms of, uh, and we know the terms, uh, in terms of being vermin, in terms of being make uh, takers, in terms of, of, of being, um, um, just labor, just bodies, bodies to do the work. And so when you strip them that way, then the Leviathan can't get there. But there are moments where the Leviathan looks up and says, oh, Shaggy, um, and realizes that that it's a new day. And that there's some stuff that the Leviathan has to know. And then you find the Leviathan then going after that knowledge too. So when the Leviathan is being brought to bear, and it's usually the pressure that is coming in from the oppressed on the Leviathan that forces the Leviathan to know, to learn, to rethink, to say, okay, the way I've been doing business, I can't keep doing business like this. I just can't. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's the power of the humanities. So we are um, we are at time and there's so much that we could keep talking about and so much that is happening in the chat. So um, uh, I see you all. Uh, we hear you all. And thank you for this avid participation. Um, but to conclude, I'd like to ask each of you first, Juan Felipe and then uh, Carol, to leave us with a phrase, a line of poetry, uh, a, 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 a saying, a word. Mm -hmm. Something that you find gives you power and light that you want to share with everybody else. Juan Felipe, if you could start. All right. Uh, the power is in you. And the answer is in you. And within that answer and that power, there is kindness. And that kindness is global and beyond all the way to the stars and back. And that is a lot of power. That power you have, it's your inner voice, it's your true self, it's your open arms, it's your life, and that is a task. It is your life itself, and Alexa is jumping in over here, it's Siri. <laughs> Siri, please. <laughs> You're like, hush, child. <laughs> she likes what you're saying. She wants... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Carol, what will you leave us? What will you leave us with? We have the power if we tap into it. And if we imagine democracy, imagine democracy in its fullness, imagine democracy in terms of our freedom dreams, imagine democracy in terms of realizing our humanity. We have the power to do that, and we must do that. Mm. Well, Juan Felipe and Carol, thank you so much for this hour of power. And it is reaching far and wide um, with all of your um, wisdom and all of the richness of your thinking and all of the generous, generous openness of your hearts and minds. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody who is listening and participating. Uh, we have these conversations regularly, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.